Okay, I'll get started right away. Time is short. My name is Devin Erickson. I'm from the Business School, School of Accountancy. And I'm going to talk a little bit, just one strategy for encouraging engagement of your students when using PowerPoint. So, uh, common complaints about PowerPoint. It's boring, it's non-interactive, maybe even outdated. These are actually common criticisms of accounting as well, by coincidence, but <laughs> some of the advantages of PowerPoint. It's an organized way to communicate information, it's efficient, and it actually can elicit participation if it's constructed well. So you're kind of seeing a sample of my approach with PowerPoint in my class. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of my slides here, but this is a sample slide. In accounting, I have very specific content that I don't really get to determine. So I want to make sure I cover it all. What I do is I cover up some of the content and I distribute notes packs, which are on your tables here, with blanks where these red boxes are. So when I ask about the primary objective of financial reporting, usually I'll say, what do you guys think it is? And then I'll reveal the box saying it's useful for making capital allocation decisions. Or that we assume that users have a reasonable understanding of accounting concepts. So my students are following along in the notes that they have printed out, that I have printed out and brought to the classroom and I reveal the information as we go along. You would be amazed at how important it is to students that they write in the information from every little red box. If I skip one, they'll stop me and say, whoa, 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 we don't know what that box is, even in accounting. So I'm not going to go through all of this. I just wanted to give you a sense of how frequently I leave blanks in my notes, enough to keep them engaged, but not so much that they get lost. If you don't do this, if they're just writing all their own notes, I lose them. Uh, they're, they're too busy to listen to what I'm actually saying. So let me just skip through here. That gives you a sense. After that, I usually do a practice problem. So I'll start out with uh, a walkthrough in this practice problem for Starcorp Mall. Name that reference. Stranger Things. OK. So I'll do a walkthrough. In the first row, I'll say a stockholder invests $10,000 in a business. Is this a transaction? And I'll ask them. They'll give me an answer, and I'll show them on the slide. What accounts are affected? I'll ask them. Lots of back and forth here. I'll walk through two rows and I'll say, all right, let's get in groups. And all of you try this on your own. Once they've tried it on their own, then I'll walk through each of these lines with them, asking specific groups for their solutions. So lots of engagement back and forth as we use these PowerPoint slides. OK, uh, time is almost up. So just a few tips if you're going to take this approach. First, I recommend you create your materials in Word first. It's actually hard to translate from PowerPoint to Word. It works better the other way. Be careful not to require too much writing. Uh, you will lose the students. I've made that mistake. Also, it's still important to leave PowerPoint occasionally to break things up. You may just want to blank the screen occasionally uh, as you're going through, or leave and see a news article or something else. And then finally, don't put everything you want to talk about in the slides. Leave some room for conversation. Uh, if, if everything's on the slides, you tend to lose them a little bit as well. So if you have any questions about specifics about how to implement this approach, please let me know. My email address is on the handout that's here, Devin Erickson. And the panelists' email addresses are all at the bottom of this handout. So feel free to email any of us with your questions. My time's up. I'm going to pass it on to Jennifer. I don't, oh, I've got one that's working. Nope. Thank you. All right, my name is Jen Gruy. I'm from the College of Education. Um, I teach in the psychology department, and my main area is teaching, and it's teaching kind of large classes. I teach classes that have typically over 100 students, usually several hundred students. And so one thing from my teaching philosophy that I have tried to implement in some different ways is trying to um, do more individualized attention and mentorship with students in these large classes. Now, I use the term mentorship pretty loosely. Sometimes in a class of like 250 students, 300 students, I might only be able to connect with that student one time this semester, but I think that's better than nothing, better than having no connection with them. So I wanted to give you a few ideas. They certainly have worked for me, but they may not necessarily work for you in all situations. Um, one idea I had, um, or that I've utilized, is I always do a first day of the semester a card, a note card. It takes a little bit of time. I ask them a series of questions that are kind of specific to my class. And then I have, I have myself or a teaching assistant go through and I um, organize them, alphabetize them. 
One thing that I like to do, though, is later on in the semester, when I'm going through examples with my psychology content, I like to use some of the information that they put on the cards in my examples in class. So students are like, hey, that's my favorite band, or oh, wow, that's something that I did this last summer, or whatever it happens to be. And so students tend to really like that. Um, and then it helps them kind of feel a little bit more connected to the class. Another thing that I've utilized over um, the last few years is I use an online scheduling tool for my, so in addition to office hours, so students do have uh, some times that they can drop in and talk with me, but I also provide students with a personalized link, and I update that um, regularly, but students can actually click on my link and they can see the different times that I'm available throughout the week to meet with me. I usually do 10 or 15 minute appointments for these kind of meetings, and students can click on that link and they can sign up for that time. It's really nice because it kind of, it, it's, um, students have said that it's more likely to get them in the door because they know that I have their email address and they know that, and if they don't show up, I email them, I say, hey, I noticed you were on my schedule and I didn't see you today, um, you know, is everything okay? And so the online scheduling tool has been really fun to use with the students. Um, one that I don't actually, I haven't actually analyzed, I've got some data that I'm gonna analyze, but I haven't done that, so you're gonna have to just deal with uh, kind of my anecdotal experience with this. But I added um, what's called a, I, I call it my life happens policy in my class, in my large class. Um, every semester I get numerous, as I'm sure all of you, numerous requests from students for extensions on assignments, on exams that sort of thing, um, where they will, they all have these like amazing excuses. And I, I'm stuck in this position where I'm like, okay, is being stressed out about your roommates, is that worthy of an excuse versus um, you got an offender bender, you know, trying to evaluate these different excuses. And so I implemented this life happens policy where it's a very small amount of points but the students are welcome to use it and then they get an extension on, so one of the due dates, I, I, I give them an extension and I tell them, no questions asked, they, they always tell me anyway <laughs> what's going on. I'm like, you don't have to tell me anything, you can just say, I wanna use my life happens policy and, um, and, 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 we, and they lose the small amount of points but they're able to hand in all the assignments. Anyway. I'm out of time, but <laughs> that's a few of the ideas that I had for you on, in terms of individualizing your mentorship in larger classes. Okay, testing, test. thank you. So my name is Wade Goodridge. Uh, I'm an associate professor in engineering education attached to college engineering. I'm, I'm really here to talk to you a little bit about experiential learning with some authentic problems today, uh, which lends itself kind of nice to engineering as far as uh, some of the pedagogy techniques that I use. Um, I, can, I can go into a lot of depth here on some of the theory, but I'll just give a real cursory overview. Experiential learning is, is really look, learning through reflection on doing. It's, it's seated in kind of a constructivist uh, pedagogical technique uh, from the work of John Dewey, Kurt Lewin, and Jean Piaget back in the day. Uh, the more important part of that is probably, for me, is the application in my class. And, uh, and that would involve some of the activities that we run. So when we get into our class, uh, into this particular class, uh, it's, a, it's a, a class called statics. It's a study of forces at rest or at moving a constant velocity within a rigid body system. And so there's lots of things that we can look at every day to, to kind of bring that home to a student. And so I can get pictures and things like that of existing structures being uh, worked on here on campus or in many other locations and bring them in. The important thing I think to remember when you bring this type of uh, uh, material into your class is to follow good curriculum design practices. So I use a, a backwards design practice where I think of the outcomes or the skills I wish the students to leave the class with as the first uh, thing that I'm concerned with and then I decide on acceptable evidence that ensures mastery of that particular outcome. What What's going to prove to me that they're, they're getting there? And then plan the learning experiences and instructions that you, do, that you give to deliver the knowledge so that they can, they can engage and develop that evidence for you. Uh, that's, that's not new. It's been out there quite a bit. It's sometimes new to engineering, but 
It's something that I've found has really worked well to help me dial in my curriculum for authenticity because ultimately I'm looking kind of from a vocational perspective and asking myself, these students need to be able to, to be viable when they move into the, their first engineering job. So what, what's important in those uh, engineering jobs that they need to be able to do? And you can get that from industry. So, we, so I tap into that a little bit. Um, a good example activity I can run you through really quick is the uh, 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 work that I do with um, kind of a bridge activity or a truss system. We analyze trusses to find out the forces that exist in them. And if you, if you dig deep into experiential learning uh, from Kolb's model that he developed back in the day, there's really four parts of it. There's a reflective observ or sorry, a concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation. We're, I'm trying to hit these main areas when I do an activity like this. Uh, when I have the students initially start the activity and they're, they're looking at the trust and I'm asking them, okay, what, you know, what do you think this is and, and how, how do you think it's going to transfer forces and things like that. And then we, we get in there and we break it. And we try to find out you know, what, what's happening when it breaks. That's, that's concrete experiments or experience. This is followed by open questions to the group about why it broke the way it did, things like that. We move into reflective observation when we do that. And then I ask students when they would recommend a truss uh, to an engineer or an architect or a contractor. It's a, a load supporting device. When would they actually make that? We're moving at that point into abstract conceptualization, pushing them beyond just that rote memory, uh, memorization type learning of here's a procedure I run through to calculate these values, but now we're pushing them into when would this be applied? And then finally, uh, we engage in active experimentation. We get out there and uh, have the, the students actually uh, um, build some, some things and and think about how they can change it and change it so that we can test it again and, and have it improve and things like that. Uh, this is only one of several projects I use in developing in my class. Uh, it's a large class. Uh, but I also, to, to hit the part of reflective observation or, or reflectivity in this, in this type of uh, uh, learning environment, I have an online learning log where students are forced or asked, I guess they're not forced, <laughs> to log in every week and tell me what they've learned, and then tell me an application that they've seen in that week of where this thing actually is. And that's worked really good to, to get a barometer or a reading on the, on the students' pulse in the class, especially in a class of 200 something students. All right, my name is Mateo Savoy Roscas. I'm an assistant professor in the nutrition, at, uh, nutrition, dietetics, and food sciences department. And today I wanted to talk about one way that I like to connect with students outside the classroom that I think helps create success for them inside my classroom. And it's something that I call Meet the Professor. It's uh, basically, it's something that I implement specifically in my community nutrition class. This class typically has about 85 students that are enrolled each year. I've taught this class for seven years and the first several years that I taught it, I realized that for the first couple months, I had the same handful of students that were participating in class. I also had the same handful of students that would come to me and ask questions and really be engaged. And I wanted to think of a way of how I could engage the rest of the class and help them connect with me. And so I started implementing Meet the Professor, and it's a way for students to meet with me outside of the classroom within those first two weeks of the semester. So basically what I do is on the first day of class, I tell everyone in the class, I invite them to come to my office sometime within those first two weeks, and I try to be as flexible as possible during that time. And so they can come to my office before or after class, they can come during my office hours, they can schedule an appointment with me, or they can just stop by if they're in the building. And uh, during this time, I'm really focusing on getting to know them as an individual. So I ask obviously their name, their major, but also what their interests are, what they wanna do in their career, what their educational and, and uh, career goals are. So, uh, you know, kind of depending on time, some students wanna talk a little bit longer, so I may go in more depth, but that's kind of where I get started. So it's an opportunity for me to get to know them really quick early on in the semester and it's also an opportunity for me to connect with them personally before we really get into the semester so i also use this time to remind them to come to you know my office or to ask any questions or you know indicate if they have any concerns early on and also remind them to get involved in the class and be a really engaged learner 
I say these things on the first day of class, and I say them to everybody as a large group, but I have found that it's most beneficial when I meet with them individually, because then what I can do is if they talked about certain things about themselves, I can say, you know what, I think it'd be really beneficial for you, know, for you to potentially bring some of these things up during discussions, during our sl small and large group discussions throughout the semester. And it really kind of indicates that I value their experiences and I value you know, their engagement in the classroom. So they can get up to five points for coming to meet with me. So if they miss one of our five in-class quizzes, they can get kind of those points reimbursed. Um, that's really the only incentive other than kind of connecting with me outside of the classroom. So I have found this to be incredibly beneficial. It does take some extra time, especially for 85 students. Not all students take me up on it, but many of them do. And I feel like I've had much greater engagement and involvement in the classroom from early on. And I also learn my students' names a lot faster, which I feel like, again, helps with that connection that we built. Um, I also do a kind of mid-semester optional meeting that uh, is kind of similar in structure. And these typically more focus on content in the courses, assignments, and uh, more into you know any questions about graduate school, internships, things like that. But I think this five-minute meeting is the one that's most impactful to increase that engagement and connection with students in the classroom throughout the entire semester. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren. I teach biology one and two laboratory courses in this building, actually. And this fall, we will have 40 lab sections with 24 students per section. And um, I coordinate that. I, I teach it along with um, 16 graduate teaching assistants that I train. Anyone want to trade jobs with me? <laughs> um, so the coolest thing we do in these courses is we engage students in real collaborative research projects where they don't know the outcome of the projects going into them. And um, creativity comes in handy such that two minds are better than one. And so this is one of our main learning objectives. Okay, and people either love or hate group work, right? Um, but I still advocate for this learning objective because these slides are going on their own. Okay, there we go. Um, because students work on real life skills like uh, conflict resolution, that's a good one. We dive pretty deep into content during class because students are analyzing their ideas with each other. And group work is, it's nice for, um, it's a nice support system or can be for students who are struggling with college life. So in these courses, we start with whoop, number one here, and we assign students up front to groups of three or four. And students are in those groups all semester. They're not allowed to change groups when the going gets tough. And we use the information on online rosters, in the online rosters, for um, minimizing isolating students of particular backgrounds. Um, then number two here, so in the Biology 2 laboratory, students have two main um, group assignments. One is writing a research proposal where they set up their well-researched hypothesis, then they talk about their well-designed experiment they'll conduct to test that hypothesis. They spend many weeks of the semester conducting that experiment, and then at the end they do a research presentation and share with the rest of the class their experience with the process of science. So we give them written documents about all our detailed expectations for those assignments, and I got the Science Writing Center's help with editing those um, documents for clarity, and that was really great. Then number three here, for the first time this year, we're gonna have group members sign a contract at the beginning um, where they'll restate the project goals, they will assign roles to each other, they'll decide up front what to do with the non-participant, right? Number four, we um, tell students that difficulties during group work are common, are normal, and they can be resolved. Number five, um, we do give, instructors do give the groups some space so they develop self-sufficiency, but we check in often about their progress, about stumbling blocks. Every week we give them written feedback on their drafts that then they can, are encouraged to incorporate into their final drafts. Um, twice, um, so after the, the research proposal, and then again after the research presentation, we have the students fill out peer evaluations. They grade themselves and each other in terms of how equally everyone in the group contributed to the project, and those two time points are really nice, so you can look for improvement in that group, the teamwork mindset. 
we provide just one group grade, a grade for the group on those two major products, and that sends the message that group effort is important. Okay, so a couple years ago in 2017, we had a very simple peer evaluation. The grading scale was between zero and two. Um, and as I mentioned, our sample size in this course is quite decent, six n equals 631. And if you look at the means across time, right, 146 to one, 1.46 to 1.78, it was nice to see some improvement in that average individual contribution score over the semester. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I'd love to hear your success stories with group work. Good morning, my name is Karin de Jonga Kanon. I'm in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. So in the social sciences, we often assign term papers. Raise your hand if you assign a term paper ever. All right, I'm going to talk about a twist to the standard research paper slash term paper. Uh, the reason I uh, developed this twist is because I wanted to reward the students more for the work of searching than for the finished product. I too often got students that slapped together a finished product, um, knowing beforehand what they wanted to say and just kind of skimming research to support what they wanted to say at the outset, which to me is not learning. That's just getting a grade. So for the iSearch project, students generate a research question that's interesting to them. Then they go to a librarian session on how to search the scholarly databases that the library subscribes to. This is news to them. They've all been using Google Scholar. And they've been dealing with the brick walls that you get in Google Scholar, which is you have to whip out your credit card and pay. They're astonished that the library has all this amazing scholarly research for free and that they never knew how to actually use it because they were never invested in their own research question. So they find their first five scholarly sources and write notes about them. And that is an assignment that they turn in, the question plus the five sources. This is early in the semester. It's week three. There's plenty of time for me to spot problem areas and guide them toward successful completion. A couple of weeks later, they now have 10 sources with their notes. They have tweaked their research question because they've realized that their research question led them down the wrong path or is no longer interesting or needed to be narrowed or broadened, whatever. They are totally focused on the question and the scholarly research. I've got them where I want them. This is where they're earning the most points for the assignment. And only after all this do they get to write a paper, and it's short. It's three to four pages summarizing what they've found in terms of bits of the answer to their research question. And whatever conclusion they believe they are able to draw at this point, which usually isn't that solid of a conclusion, they realize that well, actually, I've only read 10 scholarly sources. I think I would need to read more if I wanted a more solid conclusion, which is beautiful, right? They finally see that scholars have been addressing interesting questions for decades and that there's a whole body of scholarly research out there on a topic that's interesting to them and that you're never done reading about it, that conclusions are always tentative and um, might be revised as you read more. So this is how I structure my term project. I see we have only five minutes left in our session, so we would like to open this up to discussion. Your ideas and your experiences regarding the six topics on which we have presented this morning. I will run around with a mic. Rose. I wanted to ask Jen, what's the app that you're using, the online scheduling tool? Would you mind sharing that? Okay, I've used it a couple. The one right now I'm using is Calen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I've used a few different ones, and I can kind of tell you the pros and minuses. The one I'm using right now is Calendly. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I really like, um, yeah, with a C. And that's one that I really like because of the, some of the different features. The free version is 
fine. If you do want to do like group appointments with students, they have like a small paid version, but the free version is great. <laughs> I'm trying to think what it is. All right. Yeah, you no, can I, email her and ask her about that. We're yeah, ready for the next question. Oh, thank you. Hi, this is a question for Professor Lucas. Could you outline the uh, details that are in the contract you ask the students to sign with project and with group work as well? Yeah, so I, we're using it for the first time this year. So the document that we will hand to students doesn't exist, but I can email it to you when it does. But it'll have you know a, a section where they can restate the goals of the project, a section for with a list of different roles that you commonly see in group work, um, write a recorder, a leader, um, so they can put their names next to those and then decide when those roles switch over time. Maybe they switch every two weeks, right? And then a section that talks about what do we do when problems arise, right? And you'd give them ideas like we get outside help and things like that. But yeah, I'll email you that if you'd like. This is a question for Cotton because I have the same challenges all the time. Um, the students always want to use Google Scholar or Project Muse because it's easier. They can just get in there and it's there. You can print it out. Um, and so I'm always struggling to get them out of that. But what do you do? Because sometimes there are some legitimate articles that they can access via those resources. So I'm always stuck. I don't know whether I should say, you can't use those, or how do you maybe allow them to use those, but make sure that they go beyond that. If you, uh, is it still on? Okay. If you have them use the USU library portal, they will get to all kinds of databases of all kinds of scholarly resources, including Project Muse. There's nothing wrong with Project Muse. And uh, they'll quickly discover how different databases operate differently with different search terms, which is all part of the fun, I think. Question over here. Uh, I have a question for you as well, Karen. Uh, so how do you uh, evaluate their searching efforts? Uh, like how do you grade their searching efforts? I understand that you value um, uh, the, uh, what is that, uh, the efforts that they give to prepare the assignments, right? So how do you break it down in your syllables or, I don't know, do you, uh, um, or you can email me. <laughs> I was going to say the standard answer is I'll email you because yeah. we are out of time, but that's a great question which I am eager to address. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you all for your time. Uh, yes. Send me an email if you want something. <laughs> Send all of us emails if you want something. Thank you for coming to our session. We'll see you soon.